Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, yeah, let's go. I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today. Welcome to today's, uh, today's CNCF webinar, Building Zero Trust-Based Authentication in Healthcare with Spire. I'm Christian Jans, Cloud Strategist at Level 25 and CNCF Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar, and we would like to welcome our presenters today, Bobby Samuels, Dev Vice President, AI Engineering at Anthem Incorporated, Frederick F. Kautz, Head Edge Infrastructure at DocAI, Emiliano, Chief Technologist at HPE, Matukesh Vali at HPE. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee, even though there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can in the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything in the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today by the CNCF webinar at the webinar page on cncf.io forward slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to today's presenters to kick off today's presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, hi, folks. My name is Umer Khan. I just wanted to give you an, a quick overview of the presentation be before I pass it over to Bobby. Uh, uh, first of all, we'll have Bobby from Anthem talking about new operating and threat models redefining healthcare. Uh, then we'll have Frederick uh, providing a bit deeper dive on why uh, particularly organizations within the healthcare industry are adopting zero trust models uh, as they adopt uh, hybrid and cloud native architectures. And then we'll have an Emiliano from HP providing a deep dive into uh, CNCF's with the Inspire projects. And Madhu, in the end, from HP will do a quick demo for everyone as well. With that, Bobby, I'll pass it over to you. Um, I'll move the slides for you. Great, thank you. So, uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for making time today. Thanks for attending. Um, we're humbled to be part of this partnership, and I'm going to walk you through the, the context of why, the, the business cases of, of why are we doing this and why are we looking at um, working with in this partnership. So um, back in 2015, we had a, um, a for lack of difference, we had a cyber, a cyber attack, a data breach. And uh, you can read about it, you can Google it, uh, check out information about it, but that um, fundamentally we had um, a security model which put a perimeter or a border around um, our, our uh, data center and our applications. And as a result of that, we continue to put more of the traditional security around it. And uh, we bolstered it, it's become uh, fairly robust um, and among the top class, we could go back, but thank you. And so we've got security as a, as a perimeter model, um, and that's, that's the model we followed. It's a, it's a very traditional model that we've used here within Anthem. And then coupled with that, we've got rising healthcare costs. And we're, we're in an interesting time right now um, with our healthcare costs and, and what, what's going on. As many of you know, the hospital systems right now that are treating uh, patients that have COVID or some other sorts of issues, um, there's some fragility in the cash flow. There's, um, there's issues with being able to get um, uh, resources to specific areas that need it. So th there's just, just fragility throughout the, the ecosystem. And so just some, just some staggering numbers is that U.S. healthcare spend is about 18% of our gross domestic, the domestic product, so the highest of any, um, any nation, um, while Europe is around, hovers around 9% or, 9 or so. In the U.S., we have some of the, the, the life expectancy is lower than the European Union. We have higher infant mortality rates. Um, we, have, um, uh, we have higher lab errors and issues that are going on. And for the first time in a long time, uh, U.S. lifespans, U.S. citizens are showing declining life expectancy. So what we know is that in, um, even with all of that, that points to healthcare being unsustainable. Just the one out of every three Americans is now drowning in some kind of un, unpaid medical debt. We're bankrupting our future. And so 
there, there's, there's lots of ownership and responsibility and blame to be passed around. But instead of looking at it that way, um, we want to be part of the solution. So as part of the solution, um, we're, we're working with technologies um, to, put, to put, and you'll hear a bit more about that, but in the zero trust space, um, and that's the framework of the foundation for what we're doing. But the idea is that we believe that um, uh, that since we're in the medical policy reimbursement financial intermediary space, we're at one of the junction points, if you will, where patients and providers all come together. Um, and so they, they, those things kind of flow through us. So what we're looking to do is, is create opportunities for uh, cloud native engineers, cloud native developers, um, in the security space as well as in the application space. And I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit about that. But Spiffy, Spire, and you'll hear about NSM um, and OPA here just a little bit. But you hear about how these projects are all coming together to lay a strong foundation. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is an overview of the project itself initiative. There's, there's several initiatives that are, that are built upon this zero trust infrastructure. But this is, once again, the project initiative or the business context. So what we believe is we, we want to be in a place um, where patient and healthcare professional actually meet. Um, and we're wanna, we want to be part of a team, part of a group. It's not a, a one-man show. It's a, a one-person show. It's uh, many, many parties coming together to transform how the patient and the clinician actually interact and what's happening in that space um, and changing the medium in which they, they talk and they work together. So that patient walks away with the same medium that the clinician walks away with. There's no, uh, there's, there's not a loss in communication. There's not a loss in what the diagnosis was, what the next steps were, and then follow up. There's many opportunities in that space. Um, and as you can see, if you search either app stores or sets of app stores, you'll find lots of tools that people are developing. Well, what we want to do is we want to make, um, make our data available, um, obviously in a secure. Um, secure manner um, and to privilege developers to come in and engineer and work in this space. So we're in process of validating internal use cases. So we're building this actively. Um, and then once that's done, we will make this available to third party uh, engineers and third party groups to come in to create applications um, based on what the needs are uh, and then start to drive and, and, and create those, these what you refer to as doc bots for now. To, to come in and, and to be spread out across this healthcare ecosystem. So to give you an idea of how the pieces look, let's go to the next slide. This is the general approach of what we're thinking. So I'm gonna start from right to left and move us through this. So once again, laying the context of, th this is built all on top of the Spiffy, the Spiffy Spire Foundation um, and a zero trust, um, zero trust um, uh, network. So from users coming in, uh, and this can be clinicians or consumers and users um, like me coming in to come into one of many front end interfaces. Uh, that can be everything from things that are showing your, your patient history and your patient record, uh, what's happened over different time. It could be through telehealth. Several of you have used telehealth. I know in the last week, um, last couple of weeks, we've used telehealth for my daughter. Uh, and other sorts of doc bots and tools that are available for end users, but also for clinicians that are trying to make decisions. Um, and then that comes into our health OS platform. And it's in the, the purple, the purple, um, purple box. But the idea is that doc bots are running to pull information to share up raw um, machine learning insights that have been running, uh, that there's uh, there's AI engines that are running in the background that are pulling together to we're training off of data today to help with recommendations, to help with um, next steps and the most effective treatment, uh, treatment outcomes. And then as well as a whole set of developer tools that exist, uh, everything from sensor toolkits and sensor data that we're, we're able to pull into pharmaceutical information that uh, people are coming in. Some, some people have as many as, you know, 30 different prescriptions that they're dealing with. Um, and, as well as applications for people to come in and say, I want to, we want to partner with you and here's what we think that we can do. Um, and so pulling in developers all the way now to the left side diagram, developers, um, AI teams, and just individuals, people that have good ideas that how we can impact the system, how they're coming together. Then across the bottom, many different data sources are coming, coming together for this. Um, as you've seen, 
Uh, you'll hear later from Doc AI. Uh, Doc AI is partnering with us through this. You'll hear from, from uh, Emiliana from Spiffy Inspire and, and how that's coming. We, we don't believe that we can pull this together on our own, and nor do we believe that one single person has the answer. Um, our fundamental belief is that this will take a partnership across um, payers, across providers, and across consumers uh, to make this all work together. So with that, I'm going to transition over into, um, and there's more to come on this, but I'm going to transition over to Frederick, and he's going to take you through the, the technologies and the pieces of how they start, how these pieces all work together for a zero trust uh, infrastructure. Hello, th thanks for the uh, thanks for the great set of, uh, of slides and information, Bobby. So uh, we're starting to see an emergence of uh, of zero trust, and uh, but we start with a little bit of, of history. So if you take a look at how systems are defended, uh, we t we currently uh, or historically we would defend our systems using uh, uh, what I like to say 11th century techniques. We defend the perimeters, we create the moats, we make it very difficult to come in from the outside to the inside, except in very controlled ways. So you end up with a hard outside, a very hardened outside, but a very squishy inside. And uh, if we can see this in practice where if you have a, you have a firewall, uh, you look at common attacks that occur where perhaps you have a, some form of application gateway uh, by let's say like a compromised version of, or an old version of something like Jakarta struts or something similar that, uh, that ends up getting uh, uh, compromised because the security updates weren't kept up with it. And then once they gain access to that system that's sitting on the edge has some connectivity out, some connectivity internal, then uh, those systems are then used as staging points in order to conduct attacks on the inside because the, the defense on the inside is much more difficult to, uh, to pull off in traditional systems. And they tend to be based on things that are not cryptographic in nature. So they tend to be based things on things like, let's go find uh, what server I need to connect to using DNS. Oh, you can poison DNS. You can do, you, you, let's go ahead and reroute, I, let's go ahead and spoof and, and route IP addresses. It's like now you have something that can, they can redirect your IP addresses to, to something else, depending on the, the type of capabilities your, your, that particular system has. And so the direction that, we, that we're trying to push is to move us away from 11, these, these perimeter defense and to move us towards something that gets us some that that solves the problem with cryptographic uh, primitives at the, at the bottom. And if you can move to the uh, to the next slide, please. Yeah, and so and so the question that I pose to everyone is, what if the attack starts here? And so start with start with that particular uh, mindset. Um, uh, next slide, please. So th this is an example one example of, among many of perimeter defense. And so we have our trusted network uh, and stick the word uh, trust in this particular one. That, that's, that's the key word is like, what is the thing that you're trusting in order to establish the rest of your, of your trust domain? So we have a trusted network. We wanna to connect to another trusted network. Um, so now we have two perimeters. Then how do we open the drawbridge to allow those two things to communicate with each other? They tend to be through things like VPNs. And then we have these workloads that sit inside. And um, next slide, please. What we want to move towards is a zero trust environment. And I wanna be very careful on my wording here. When we say zero trust environment, we don't necessarily mean that the untrusted network is uh, open to the world. You can still have your, your layers of defense. You can still have your moats and so on. But what, this, uh, what we're doing is we're saying that the workload, just because you're on the same network as another workload, doesn't mean you have implicit connectivity to that particular to that particular system, and so what we want to do is we want to establish secure connections between workload to workload, regardless as to what network that they're that they're on. Uh, you move to the next slide, please. So, when you have an attacker, it becomes much more difficult, or even if they gain access to the untrusted network there's still a lot more work that needs to, to be involved in order to compromise the system. And to give you an idea in terms of the mindset when you're trying to deal with security, one of the things that you want to do is you want to try to harden your system so that you become a hardened, you look like a hardened attacker and you want to limit the reward. So you don't want to be the organization that has a very sensitive database that's uh, fully uh, approachable and, and accessible once, you, once you've gained access to one of these systems. 
you, you want to be the one that has all of the auditing, the ones with the policy. Uh, assume that your system is going to be breached and then ask the question, what do we, what do, we do next? How, how do we mitigate it in, in that scenario? So this is a large part of what this particular environment is, uh, is, is about. Is like an attacker has already breached your network, has already breached another workload. How do we defend against, uh, against that attacker? Uh, next slide, please. So the question then is how do we achieve this? And I, this is not the only set of things you have to do, but this is where I believe you should start. You should establish a set of trust domains. So a trust domain is a, a think of it like a cryptographic uh, set of uh, systems or, or workloads that are all part of the same uh, part of the same trust domain, rooted at the top with some form of a, in this scenario, some form of a CA. Um, and that CA is able to attest, your organization CA can attest a sub-organization, which could attest maybe a cluster. Uh, at the very bottom, you want that, that attestation to say I, that this is a workload. So you can say, oh, I have a payment API and you're a payment database. And so we, we know each other's identity. And that's, and that's done through the attestation, which gives you a cryptographic primitive that you can use to prove your identity. Uh, in this scenario, an X509 certificate, which is the exact same thing that we use when you connect to your bank using your web browser, except it's not just you validating the bank, uh, but the bank validating you through your certificate. So you have your API gateway validating the database and vice versa, the database validating your cryptographic identity. So once you have identity established, then we're able to build policies. And the policy is not based upon what network access control should I set up? What IP addresses should I, should I open or block? The policy is more what identities are allowed to communicate to what identities? How are they allowed to communicate with each other? What type of messages should they have? What type of constraints should those messages have? Like, should, should I only be able to ask things that are related to my identity? Or should I be allowed to ask things that are related to someone else because we have a we have a some form of a relationship there. And finally, the, the last part of this where we really extend this out is we want to be able to establish trust between organizations. So you could say like my organization and your organization, if we're in two different orgs, uh, we can establish that trust at the CA level. And if I trust you to attest properly and you trust me to attest properly, and we have some business that we are going to conduct with each other, then my workloads can validate your workloads and, and vice versa simply by establishing the trust at the very top. And so this gives us the, the zero trust across multiple organizations. Uh, next slide, please. And so here's one application pattern where we have an identity that covers an app and we've identified a second app and they both communicate with each other with rooted in that identity. So this is the very basic pattern that most people think of when you think of, uh, zero, trust, um, of, of zero trust identity and zero trust connectivity. And uh, there could be policy that, that, that controls that particular uh, flow of, of communication between the, between the two apps. Um, move to the next slide, please. Um, uh, so in this scenario, we actually say there, they could be in two different organizations. And so same pattern, just the, uh, the, the URL, the root of that is a separate organization. Uh, next slide, please. So this one is something new that we're also pushing forward as well. And that's uh, an infrastructure pattern. So in other words, by the infrastructure, we're saying that not, your applications should not, should not only be uh, cloud native and uh, should not be the only ones that are zero trust. Your infrastructure should be cloud native. Your infrastructure should be, should be zero trust. And so there's a new effort that's going on with the CNCF through the telecom user group and similar uh, and uh, Linux Foundation networking and, uh, and a variety of other industry or bodies that are starting to look at how do we drive this identity at, uh, or not identity, but how do, we, how do we move our workloads so that our firewalls, our intrusion detection systems, our VPNs, uh, our telecom is running and, and, and is uh, established using the things like Kubernetes, uh, using cloud native uh, best practices uh, by using cloud native network functions is what they call them. And what we're pushing for is for that identity to also be the root of those, because those start to look like, uh, like workloads. They're your firewall as a service or, or your firewall inside of your, inside of your system. So we can say this identity, this pod should connect to this firewall by policy and this 
firewall should check to connect to this intrusion detection system by policy. And this one, the intrusion detection is allowed to connect to your VPN, establish validated each level of the chain through policy, through identity and policy that is, uh, that is set up to describe the communication. And so this, so this, is a, uh, this allows us to treat our infrastructure as cloud native and to treat it as something that is horizontally scalable and not as a, not as a monolith. Uh, move to the next slide, please. And so what we want to do after that is then drive this, this cross-cutting identity up and down the entire stack. So your app uh, shares an identity with the service mesh, which shares an, the same identity with your pod and, and also drives that identity as a primitive down to your hardware. You have uh, newer server hardware is coming out with, uh, with a TPM, which is effectively a, uh, you can think of it like a, uh, like a random number generator, like a crypto uh, uh, two-factor auth that's stuck in the hardware itself. And so we can, so if I ship you a box and, uh, and, I'm, the, and I'm the vendor of that particular system, I can give you some cryptographic uh, identity that says, we know that, the, that not only did the software come from us, but that the hardware came from us as well, and that that hardware was provisioned specifically for the use in this particular set of applications or these specific sites, sets of cluster. And to root the identity uh, based upon those, uh, those cryptographic primitives, literally in the hardware themselves, which then are tied together through a pod connecting to your infrastructure, uh, your app, your service mesh is communicating with each other uh, with that identity. Your application is connecting with each other in those and with with those identities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so, in short, though, if we if we say that uh, that zero trust, you need to start off with identity with identity. You need to start off with some cryptographic identity that you are able to to use as the foundational piece that then uh, that then uh, establishes all the the rest of the of the chain. Uh, next slide, please. And so the interactions that we're using uh, in this scenario, so we're starting with Spiffy and Spire. So Spiffy is the spec, Spire, and you'll hear more about this in a few moments, is, is a server that the reference implementation of Spiffy. For the policy that I was describing, uh, that, that is, uh, we're driving that through Open Policy Agent. An Open Policy Agent can take uh, the X509 certificate as an, it has an input and can also take a JWT as an input and we can make, pull out parameters out of that and then make uh, decisions, declarative decisions, like this API is allowed to connect with this, and this JWT uh, parameter should match to this based upon the policy. And then we're driving the infrastructure communication part through network service mesh, which provides cluster connectivity and network policy. So NSM can say, you must traverse through this firewall, through this intrusion detection system, through this VPN firewall uh, combo in order to connect to your private infrastructure to create or to connect to your corporate infrastructure. And so we have policy on what to connect through on there, but it's all found, it's all uh, established uh, with identity that is provided by SIFI as a first class citizen. Um, and so th those are the type of things that we're, that we're looking at with, uh, with this. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, we'll hand it off to Emiliano. So thank you very much. Hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Great. Uh, so, hi, I'm Emiliano Birnbaum. I, uh, I work at HPE, and I I'm going to go over and explain what Spiffy and Spire are. Um, and, you know, first of all, I want to, you know, thank Bobby and uh, Frederick. It's great working with the Anthem team on this, on this, because uh, it really taking the vision of what we what we did with Spiffy and Spire and, and applying it at a, at a great level. Um, so just to just to um, explain what Spiffy and Spire are for, for people that aren't um, familiar, Spiffy is is the actual um, is the uh, is a spec of uh, of of the of the of this identity uh, um, format. Uh, it basically is made up of four things that I'll get into, but it is just a spec. It is not an implementation. Spire is an actual implementation of the of the spec. Uh, that exposes uh, the workload API and will deliver these cryptographic identities to, uh, to a piece of, uh, to a workload or a piece of code that's asking for it. Now, uh, the, the Spiffy spec has been uh, adopted by a couple of different projects. Uh, Istio and uh, Console and Vault are uh, Spiffy aware. Uh, also, Nginx and uh, Envoy. Can, uh, can receive Spiffy identities. Uh, and then some other, pro some other uh, companies uh, 
you know, I, I think in general, we've built this really rich community where we've, we've had a lot of um, contributions from the, from the open source community into the project. Big contributors are, are Uber, Square, Bloomberg, and TikTok teams. Uh, and right now, um, we, you know, just to go back a little bit of history, we joined the CNCF as, I think, the first sandbox project in, in 2018. And right now, we are going through the motions of, of pushing uh, Spiffy Inspire into incubation stage. Uh, we've gone through the security review phase and should be going into community review uh, next week. Um, so that should be happening pretty soon. And then we will, we will go to the next uh, level of uh, uh, CNCF uh, project. And uh, right now we are looking at, uh, our, at, um, at uh, releasing our 1.0 for uh for spire in mid-june and we're doing a couple of refactors of some apis and wanted to get that in there before we we made our our 1.0 version uh next slide uh so as i was saying uh spiffy is the standard and it's really made up of four things uh, a Spiffy ID is just a URI string that uh, a URI that identifies uh, that workload piece of code. Uh, think of it as your driver's driver license number. It's uh, the identifier for that for that for that workload, um, and it it is um, it shows it has the trust domain uh, name in there. We we have the the Spiffy uh, prefix, which is INA. It has been registered with, registered with INA but um, it is just a URI string. Uh, after that, there is an, um, a document that has that, that identity uh, in the document. And we have two documents that we support right now. We, we have a JOT and also a X509 certificate. And a lot of the, a lot of the work that, that happened early on in the community was to figure out what exactly went into that X509 certificate. There's a lot of um, you know, simple, mistakes or things that people forget to do that that um the compromise certificates and, and that that was a lot of the great work that we did in the beginning to figure out what should go in there and also to make sure that the certificates could be consumed by by more most uh most uh pls stats and, and other other um other stacks uh and then the workload api is is, is uh how we how we deliver this this document to to a to a workload. It is a, a node local API that is exposed, and in the spec, it, we just describe um, a protobuf definition of what that API should look like. And this is what will deliver that identity to the to the workload. And the last part is the federation API. So when when uh, Frederick was talking about different organizations and trusting each other we accomplish this through the Federation API. What the Federation API allows you to do is have two different organizations be able to, to create a trust relationship between themselves and then determine what workloads within each trust organization should talk to each other. The only thing we're doing is delivering all the, all the certificates and bundles to those, uh, to those two different uh, workloads, uh, and and then we step out of the way. And and to be to be clear, I should have said this in the beginning. Spiffy Inspire really is about authentication. We don't uh, we don't authorize. We just uh, authenticate and give a piece of code its identity that it, that to do other things with. And I'll um I'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so the other part, the other uh, project is Spire. So what Spire really does is we take the Spiffy uh, spec, the, the API specs, and we've actually implemented it. It's, uh, it's run as a, an agent that shares a kernel with that piece of code and a, um, a server that holds all the policies and upstream CAs for, uh, for signing. Um, and really what we're exposing here is that that API, the Who Am I API. A workload could talk to this API either directly by using a library, uh, it's a gRPC push library, or you could have it air-gapped and have a, 
uh, a proxy in front of it. So we, we could talk to Envoy or Nginx. There's also a nice little proxy from the Square team called Ghost Tunnel that speaks uh, the workload API directly. But um, what ends up happening is that uh, either the proxy or the workload contacts the, the API, and then that sets off attestation. And what attestation is, is the process by which we introspect that piece of code, look at its characteristics, and then the agent will determine if this was the, the piece of code that it was uh, expecting. Uh, and if it is, it will deliver the identity to that, to that piece of code. And I'm, I'm gonna just walk uh, everyone through that process, explaining how attestation works. Uh, then after we're done with that, uh, Madhu is gonna show you um, to everyone a, a demo of this. Uh, can we have the next slide? So like I was saying, there's two pieces to this. There's a Spire server and a, an Aspire agent. Uh, the Spire server is what's holding the policy. Uh, so here we're, we're saying that uh, we will give the identity of uh, billing payments to a workload that meets this criteria. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, and really what we're, what we're saying is that if this piece of code is running in an EC2 instance that has this security groups and it's in this pod namespace and it's on, running on this, this uh, service account, and also has this binary image, then it is the payment uh, app, uh, workload. And one thing I wanted to emphasize is that all of this, a lot of this logic, a lot of the things that are doing this attestation at the node level and the workload level are, are plugins. So we have a catalog of different plugins for different environments. So we can take the solution and have it run on, on um, on EC2 or the different cloud providers. We could also run Azure or Google Cloud. We could also run on-prem uh, and on different orchestrators too. So the, the, the architecture of, of using these, you know, having that architecture of plugins has allowed us to uh, lift and carry the, the solution to, to different places. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll, we'll just walk over, over what this looks like, but there is, you're running a container on an instance, you have that Spire agent that is exposing that, that node local API. And uh, right now, uh, the way we do this is you have to share a kernel with that, with that workload uh, for us to do the introspection and uh, attestation on that workload. And then there's a Spire server that's running uh, somewhere else. You could run these you know, in HA mode or, or different, different ways. And uh, this is this is the baseline. So can we go to the next slide? Okay, so the first thing the Spire agent does when it wakes up, it will talk to the underlying infrastructure. Again, this is pluggable. So uh, for this type of attestation, the uh, the Amazon the Amazon plugin would go in and, and look at the look at the um, at the uh, Amazon um, uh, infrastructure and deliver the metadata back to the Spire server, basically advertising, hey, this is, this is who I am. Uh, next slide, please. And then what the Spire server does, it goes back and verifies. It says, hey, was I expecting this piece of, uh, this agent to be running here? Uh, and we're, what we're doing here is we're actually doing uh, attestation of the, of the node itself and we give it it's an identity to the, to the node also. So there's two things we identify here. We identify the agent running on that node and then the agent on that node will identify uh, the workload. Can we go to the next slide, please? And then ob obviously after, after the Spire server verifies it, he, he's, he talks to the Spire agent. Uh, next slide. Now, now we're ready and uh, the, uh, the container could talk to the, to the workload API. So just to be, um, I'm going to run through this, but just so everybody understands, there's going to be some signing going back and forth. A lot of this happens at a different order for optimizations, but we're just going to logically walk through this. So uh, the container or the, the workload talks to the workload API and basic and tries to, to get its identity. It, it queries to see who, who it is. Can we go to the next slide? Now the Spire agent will go out and uh, introspect the, the container. Uh, also, he's right. You also look at the node local kubelet. Uh, that that is also pluggable. Uh, so, like I was saying, the, not only is the node attestation pluggable, so is the the workload attestation is pluggable and extendable, right? So, if if we don't have anything in our catalog, that could always be 
added. Um, so go to the next slide. So this is the part that happens beforehand. But what happens is one of the big things we do is we never we will generate keys on that on that EC2 instance. Keys private keys never leave the box. Uh, what we do then is create a CSR request and send it to the Spire server for signing. Now the Spire server could have um, its its own self signed cert, or you could tie it up to a CA upstream. So you could chain these things together. Uh, that Spire server here logically would be the trust domain or the root of the, the root of trust for for these workloads. But again, you could chain these together. You could you could federate these Spire servers. Uh, but the the Spire agent sends the the CSR request to the Spire server, who will sign it. And can we go to the next slide, please? And then the Spire server will return the, the, the correct chain back to the Spire agent. Next slide. And the, the, the workload API returns uh, the keys back to the container. So now the, the container, the workload has its identity. Now the container could, do, could use these to create MTLS connections across, across its fabric. Uh, if you would imagine that there would be other EC2 instances with Spire agents that are that are um, that are uh, delivering these identities, they could create an MTLS tunnel and then talk to each other direct process to process. Another thing is that this API is, um, is is a push API and it's tunable. So all of a sudden, you can start um, putting tight rotations on these certificates. We could rotate everything uh, up to the up to your root because uh, everything's delivered through this API, and uh, we have the ability to rotate pretty quickly and uh, push these things out um, at a, at a higher cadence than would be normal. And you know, another thing I want to emphasize is a, a lot of what we've done here is that we've really inverted the relationship. Where a lot of times what you do is you push certificates or identities to things. Uh, what we do here is that we have a pattern that, that uh, attestation policy that we saw in the beginning. And when something meets that criteria, we deliver its material to that, to that piece of code. Um, and then the next thing that we've done beyond this, right, beyond the, the MTLS end-to-end -end communication, and this is what uh, Madhu is gonna show. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so uh, just, just to finish this thought out, um, what we've done is we have taught other systems to, uh, to um, to understand these these uh, certificates. So a lot of databases and systems can do X509 authentication. Uh, so we've, uh, we've, we have the ability now to deliver these, uh, these tokens, these certs that are ephemeral and rotate and avoid using usernames and passwords. So uh, you have an attested identity for this piece of code, strongly attested. Um, and again, one of the things that we could do is, as Frederick was showing, we could actually go down to the to the hardware level, to the TPMs, and and verify that piece that 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 whole stack, from from chassis all the way up, uh, and deliver that that identity right and rotate it. And now uh, the workload could take that identity and talk to to databases or to to other clouds. So we're also going to show uh, the JOT uh, OIDC federation with AWS, where you you don't have to. Uh, distribute those those heavy tokens, but use our tokens to to talk to these other systems. So I'm gonna I'll stop right there. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Madhu. So there might be a second as he sets up. Uh, but thank you so much for attending. Hey Madhu, folks, how's it going? Uh, hi, this is Madhu. Uh, I am today. I'm gonna walk you folks through couple of scenarios. Uh, so the core, uh, can you folks need it? Just give me one second. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna walk you folks through to a couple of scenarios here, right? So the core functionality of Spire is to create a centralized framework to deliver and manage cryptographically verifiable identities, right? So why do we need this, right? Like, so traditionally what we do is use some form of secret material, right? So we have uh, in this scenario, the first scenario that I'm gonna show you folks is about authenticating to a Postgres database, right? We have a Kubernetes workload uh, customer service here 
which wants to connect to a customer database. So traditionally what we do here is uh, we embed some form of secret material either you know, in the form of uh, configuration or bake them into your image through your CI CD pipelines or really deliver these through secret stores to your uh, workloads, right? Like, so the, so the idea behind uh, Spire is not necessarily, you know, like provide just identities, but really use these identities to authenticate without requiring any sort of secret or sensitive material to be embedded into your workloads itself, right? So this scenario that I'm gonna show you folks is about uh, using uh, the Spire server and Spire agents, which deliver the SWITs to your customer service. And uh, using those SWITs, uh, we can authenticate and validate and create an MTLS connection between the workload and the database itself, right? So we have a Spire agent running on both sides uh, of the connection here. Uh, which are connected to a centralized Spire server, and uh, each of the workloads here receive their SWINs, uh through the workload API that Emiliano was mentioning earlier. And uh, once we have that, we can establish those MTLS connections, right? So the first thing I wanna show you folks is uh, about something we talked about earlier called registration entries, right? So what are registration entries? So in this scenario, we have the customer service, right? So this is the entry for the customer service. So what this is really saying is, I want to register the Spiffy ID to a workload that is running on Kubernetes cluster and has the specific container name, right? So this is the property of the workload, which the Spire agent attests, right? So this is a workload API. Whenever the workload tries to connect to it, it attests the workload to have this property and only provision it uh, X509 certificate and deliver it to the workload with this PID if this property is satisfied, right? So there are other corresponding uh, registration entries in our application, um, but the uh, main thing that I wanna focus here is there is an additional entry here, additional field here, and what this is really saying is, in addition to just providing this in your X509 certificate, also use uh, a field as your subject CN, which corresponds to the database user, right? So, so the idea here is to use existing authentication primitives that are native to your uh, Postgres database uh, and somehow use that and mint that into your X509 certificate, right? So in Postgres, if the subject CN, uh, I'll show you folks how the um, SWIT really looks like. And here is an example of that SWIT, right? That, that we are using for the customer service that is trying to authenticate to the database. And if you look at the subject CN here, uh, what we see here is that the SIM user, right? So this is the user uh, the database user that is embedded into the SWIT itself. So since that is embedded in there, now we can authenticate to our database here using the construct of authentication that is native to PostgreSQL itself, right? So the, so the same SWIT that you could use anywhere else now can be used to like authenticate to a database, right? Like, so that's kind of the first use case here. Uh, let me show you the actual application. So here we have this application. Uh, this part here is coming from the customer database, uh, the Postgres database. And if uh, it is able to like receive that and uh, show it on the, uh, the web application is able to like show this uh, because it is able to authenticate to the database, right? So now let's go ahead and change this uh, registration entry. Um, so, and disable this, right? So 
what I did was the registration entry here, I changed this DNS name to something else, right? So this is no longer the database user. And if we go back here and refresh this page, we no longer see that customer database coming in. So that, that's the first use case uh, about authenticating to uh, Postgres database uh, using X509 SFIT, right? So the second thing that is, you know, personally to me is more interesting is authenticating to an external public cloud like AWS without requiring any sort of credentials, right? So traditionally, typically you would need uh, a, a, a workload that is running on, let's say like a GKE cluster, uh, which is on Google Cloud, if you want to like authenticate it to uh, Amazon RDS, which is on AWS, you would need to somehow deliver these AWS credentials to your transaction service, which is a workload on GKE, right? So how would you do this is again through like your, uh, you know, like your CICD pipeline, you embed it, or through secret store, but really, you still need that secret, right? So the, the whole notion about using Spires to like get away from storing secrets anywhere, if, you know, like so. So the idea here is to have a web PKI set up between your Spire server and your AWS. So in AWS, we have something called uh, Open uh, Open IDC o OIDC which is a provider, right? So you can set up a federation between your Spire server and your AWS um, account and create an identity provider within your AWS, right? So what that helps us once we set up this web PKI is for Spire to transmit the public keys uh, to your AWS setup. And those public keys can be used to validate the JOT SWID that the transaction service here receives through your Spire agent. So further, this can be embedded into your roles and the role itself can verify and authenticate uh, the IAM role, which is native to your AWS, can authenticate and establish that uh, secure connection between your transaction service and AWS. So the other thing here is about like setting up that uh, web PKI. We are using like Let's Encrypt uh, through Acme uh, protocol. And uh, so that, that's how we do that, right? So just to show you folks what that looks like, we have uh, a token, a JOT token here. So this is the JOT token the transaction service uses, right? So if we look into the JOT token, what we are seeing here is that it has the subject CN defined to the transaction service SPIFI ID, and we have an audience that is set to my RDS. And if we actually look at the setup here on AWS console, we have a role, right? So if I go back here, we have a role. Uh, and in this role, if I look at it, it is federated with the identity provider, right? So this is the identity provider, which is receiving your public uh, keys, uh, which it uses to authenticate the job aspect, right? So further in here, we have conditions for this particular role to, as, to be assumed if these conditions are met, right? So one is the audience that corresponds to the job token, and this is the SPIFI ID in the subject, uh, which corresponds to the transaction service SPIFI ID. So if I go ahead and change this to something invalid here, um, and update the policy, right? So now, uh, so let me like revoke this because to revoke the kind of existing active sessions, but uh, this role is also, the, if we look at the policy here, it is showing that it has uh, this particular role can connect to the RDS database, which happens to be the MySQL database, right? So if I go back here and uh, look at our uh, application, and if I refresh this, uh, this, uh, this information, which is coming from the transaction database, I should no longer be coming in. Takes a while before this is expired. It expires in just a few seconds there. But the idea here is to like establish that uh, you know like a secure connection 
between a workloads that is running on your GKE cluster and RDS database without requiring any sort of credentials, right? So this is kind of uh, the main use case here. So at this point, we should be able to do that. So this here, while we are waiting for that to expire, I want to show you like this, this is part of the OIDC Federation. This is part of the standard. And what we have here is the well-known uh, endpoint, which has uh, the OpenID configuration. And this is the jocks URI on which we deliver these, uh, uh, these public keys to uh, validate and authenticate the uh, service that is coming in. So now we can see that the job desperate has expired and we are no longer seeing the information for the transaction service uh, on the web app. So that's pretty much the demo. Uh, at this point, I want to like, uh, you know, like give it back to Umer uh, to, yeah. for some closing remarks. Yeah, um, if Madhu, you can just keep this slide open, it might be easier. Could you bring this slide back up? Sure. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Before we go into the Q&A, um, I just wanted to remind folks that if you wanted more information on Spiffy and Spire, uh, please visit spiffy.io. We also have a very active channel on Slack. It's a great place for to connect with like-minded like uh, security engineers, platform engineers, all who are trying to adopt the free inspire within the infrastructure. Uh, please, uh, looking forward to seeing you, a lot of you folks um, on this Spiffy Slack channel. Um, so looking at the questions now, um, Emiliana, I'm gonna ask this question to you. I think, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, um, uh, I've also seen something related to this uh, Google worker identity. Um, what are your what are our thoughts on it? How is that different from Spiffy and Spire? Emiliano, you want to take that one or Madhu? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big things about Spire is that um, it's um, you can take it and have it run across multiple uh, multiple different clouds or environments, right? We're not really tied down to only um, Kubernetes or a certain cloud, and that the fact that we have um, our plugin model and, and, our, and our solution that can be run from a lot of different places to federate. Um, what we're trying to do is span these different walled gardens, right? Where a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of these different clouds or environments have their way of doing things, right? So if you're on prem, you might be using um, Kerberos, or if you're if you're in the cloud, you're using uh, the different different metrics or different ways that. Um, these systems identify things, and what we do is we can sit on top of that. So I don't know the particular um, uh, details about uh, the workload uh, um, identity that uh, GKE is using, but our our solution works in and out of, of uh, Kubernetes. It can, it can work on, on instances, so it's a little more portable in that way. Uh, and I'll take the next one too. It says from Ravish. Um, so the I think the big thing with Ravish about if we could if we could start going away from secrets and secret management, uh, it really it depends on the systems, right? A lot of these a lot of these systems. Hey, Emiliano, can you oh. can you repeat the question too? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question is, does this mean that we could somehow somehow make two totally different systems talk to each other without having having to have any secret credentials to manage? So um, <clears throat> it depends, right? It depends on, on what systems they are. So for a lot of um, a lot of databases and queues, a lot of these things will do X509 uh, authentication to those systems. If they have that support for X509 certificates, then we could tie it into those systems. Um, <clears throat> if the systems only allow usernames and passwords, uh, then then you, know, you have to use usernames and passwords. We 
are looking at adding other protocols um, in the open source. It's something that we're, we're looking at. But um, if it's X509 or JOTS, uh, then we could do that. I think one of, one of the things you didn't see with what Madhu was doing is that when we send our JOT to, to AWS, uh, we'll, we'll get a token back and then we exchange that token uh, to then talk to the RDS system. And that all happens underneath. But if something does OIDC federation, we can teach it to talk to, uh, to, that, um, to that endpoint that we expose, um, and then it could, it could consume our token. So it really depends on the systems that you're talking about. Yeah, and um, Frederick, do you, uh, you want to add uh, something to a GKE question? Yeah, so you... GKE, GKE workload identity. And so the, my understanding and how that works is that it ties your Google identity to your Kubernetes, your IAM identity to your Kubernetes uh, service account. And then you can use your service account uh, secret in order to access the Kubernetes, uh, access Google-based services or things that are rooted within that, uh, within that uh, IAM uh, uh, identity. And that is a fantastic way to do things. So like, we're not saying you're using this, therefore you, ca you can't use that. So if the thing that you're working with integrates very well with that environment uh, or with that security system, that is something that you can, that you can definitely bring into it and, and tie into your, into your infrastructure. Uh, when you're starting to look at like, how do I get my cloud to talk to your cloud? Or what if, what if I'm on AWS or I have things that are crossing on-prem or so on? Uh, then uh, Spiffy and, and Spire uh, provide a much more broad uh, uh, solution towards this. And because it's rooted in an X509 certificate, that means that anything that can work with an X509 certificate, uh, even if it doesn't get full mutual TLS style support, Still can still get some support. You can still tie it into things like your key rotations and so on to in order to, in, in order to help establish those those connections and, and identity. Of course, if you use something like mutual TLS using TLS 1.3, then you'll get the full benefit of it. Um, and so, yeah, I don't have any more to add on that at this point. That's a big topic. Great, Christian. Do you want to? Um, I, I think we're just about to close. So. Uh, I think before I pass it over to Christian, uh, if you have more questions, Frederick, Miliano, Madhu, myself, everyone is on Spiffy Slack as well. So we're happy to take some questions there as well. Cool, great. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was great. All right. And that's all the time we have for the questions for today. Thank you for joining. The webinar recording and slides will be online later today. We are looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day.